Good morning. It's, uh, it's an absolute honour for, uh, for me to come and, and to just to serve amongst you guys, to be a part of this church family in the, in the bigger scope of things, and even more so to open God's Word together with you and to get into this. And, and I'll give you the heads up. If you have a um, scripture with you, whether it's hard copy or soft copy, the key text you want to look at is Matthew 25. 31 to 46. And I just want to give you the chance, if you have that, you can look it up now. It's not going to be on the screen this morning because it's a big slab. And I actually find if we spend time looking at a screen for a big slab, we sort of stop taking it in so much. So if you don't have it, my encouragement will be for you just to listen. And actually for a big slab, we can go on the story easier listening. Um, At least that's my opinion anyway. And it's also a massive privilege because I'm not just coming and just preaching a sermon, but I get to serve in amongst a series that you guys are in the middle of, First Love. And so I hope for a bit of grace this morning because hopefully I can step right into the right space because there's, of course, the chance in the middle of a series to not quite find the rhythm. So please uh, extend me that grace. And so it's my pleasure that I get to share a, cl- a topic that's close to my heart and it's going to be called, I Want More Coffee. Um, it's got nothing to do with the series at all. And actually, ironically, I, I hate coffee, okay? A little bit more about me, though, okay? I hate coffee. Um, I won't let the fact I hate coffee get in the way of a good joke. I, uh, I often tell people, as well as my wife, I remind her that I am the funniest person she's ever met. Um, I'm married to Sarah. We have three kids, Reuben, Abigail, Matilda. Um, I'm the brunette version of Ryan, okay, which means I'm the brunette version of Ed Sheeran. Um, I understand that um, Ed got his guitar out a couple of weeks ago. So um, I love my sport. For some people, you might appreciate to know that that includes fantasy football, okay? Um, I do support the Bulls. When we moved up to Wollongong, because I was Victorian, born and bred, um, Central Victorian Bendigo, moved up to here. I used to support Melbourne City since they started. And I was, you know, I was on the long journey. And honestly, we moved up here. We had won nothing. And so MacArthur starting up, I thought, you know, founding member, this will be special. Join MacArthur and then Melbourne City started winning everything. (laughs) But I am a a sport person with the Bulls. Despite being in formal ministry for 15 years, I haven't, um, I, I, I still look under 60, okay? So I think I'm doing fairly well in that regard. I love Jesus. And there's nothing more that God has put in my heart than to serve his people. And that includes those who don't know that, he, that they are his people yet or not. And so I, that's that what it, um, gets my heart beating Um, It drives me in who I am as a person and who I am in ministry. And as uh, as Ryan mentioned, I'm I'm the lead pastor at New Day Church, uh, which is the old Wollongong Church of Christ down in Fig Tree there. In this first love series, I want to build on what's already been shared. And so um, I want to introduce the idea then into this series around serving others. Serving others. The whole series has been birthed out of the passage of Matthew 22. And I'm just going to paraphrase it to start with. Love God, love others. Um, And in this, uh, we're going to be fleshing out a little bit more, just a little bit more around this loving others. Because love others is, is really broad. Okay, I've seen many a person go to the pub, particularly blokes, seeking to love others. That is not what we're talking about this morning, okay? We're going we're gonna to hopefully head into a more specific space of actually how we are encouraged by Jesus to love others. Two weeks ago, Ryan also mentioned that through this year, it's going to be a lot about our hearts and our hands, or your hearts and your hands. I'm not going to bother. But your hearts and your hands. And he, in around hearts, talked around rededication. But I just want to encourage you, it's really easy as we talk about serving others to think, all right, so this is going to be the hands part. Woe up a little. 
because it is actually as much about your heart as it is about your hands as well. Jesus tells an expert in the law. This is uh, the specific in Matthew 22, verse, um, verses 38 to 39, or a little bit more of that. He says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. So we see Jesus. We, we understand he puts God to come first. But actually the outworking of loving God represents itself in loving others as well. So I hope you realize that serving others isn't a contending priority, which was talked about last week. Loving others is a complementing priority. And so we're going to see what Jesus says in and around this because he, he said something pretty clear and I would say it's actually a fairly blunt message that he gives to those who are listening in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. So let me read to you this text and either follow along for yourself. Always good to follow along because you don't, you don't want to be taking what I say for God's word. You find it for yourself. Otherwise, you can listen this morning. He says, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right. Congratulations, you guys, this morning. And the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked. Yes, you were, guys. And you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. And then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did, you ever see, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it for me. Now the flip side, of course, he continues. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. You know, when Jesus has strong words like this, it's so that we sit up and listen to what he's saying. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or strange or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you're refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Melbourne would be the city that I have seen the most homeless people living on the streets in my life. In my time travelling a little bit overseas, in um, being in different places in Australia, the most. You know, you know, it took, took trips of um, you know, uh, young people down to uh, Youth Alive's or Planet Shakers Conference, different things like that, and, and often confronted and, and journeying with those guys of how do we deal with, with what we've encountered here. There's a guy locally um, near, near us, and uh, think about the, the words, you know, until you've walked a, a mile um, or a thousand miles or however far in their shoes, how do you really know what it's been like? And, and this guy um, who, who visits, uh, I know where he lives. He lives in between us and the supermarket, and, and so he's often down at the supermarket, and I was watching one day, and I, he doesn't have any socks. He's got his shoes, 
I was like, right, I'm going to do it. Off we go. I got some socks. It was winter. got a jacket. got all this stuff. Offered him the stuff. He was not interested at all. Whatever. You know, like a thousand miles. Into, well, I would want socks on my feet. Well, apparently he doesn't. Oh, I tell you, the things I've done, you know, tried countless. But actually the encouragement is for us to serve others. Not to control how they receive. It's to serve others. Let's, um, let's get back to it. So I'll just tell the story. Jesus makes a pretty clear point. When he's telling the story, it's not like other stories where it's like a Rubik's Cube. And you really need to know the formula or some, some other ways to go about it to solve it. There's none of that. It's really clear. And, and don't, please don't respond when I say this. But we could just end it right here. Jesus has said the message pretty clear. There's maybe a bit of guilt in this. But Jesus does it. But I do want to unpack it a bit further. There is an inextricable connection between loving him and loving others. Loving others is an expression of loving God. We can't do one without the other. You cannot love God well. If you felt at all motivated by the rededication message two weeks ago and felt really pushed into, I've got to push into Jesus, you can't love God well if you are not loving others well as well. Awesome thing about this church and some of the, church, some of the churches I've been involved in is that, of course, you've got the community hub, right? And it's like, yeah, great. Like we, we are trying our best. We've got opportunities, not just here, but we, we try and get out and, and reach and connect with people and serve them best we can. But the real trick is in those contexts is then we go, yeah, great, we're doing that. Well, actually, some of us are doing that. And actually our church does that. But Jesus is in these really confronting words, using them because then the individual gets confronted. and so. I don't want you to rest on those laurels of, oh, our church does. I think the words are confronting for us as individuals. How am I serving others? And we see this expression all through this idea of loving God and loving others all through the scripture. Even take communion, for example, as as Jesus encourages us to have communion. He tells us two things. When you gather... That's the others, that's the together, that's the community we're a part of. Remember me, that's God. So time and time again through the scriptures, we see that it's not one and the other, but it's both. Jesus listed some of the clear and present needs of his day. But I want to ask you, can you think of some of those clear and present needs of his day? And I want you to not just one but the other. So I'll give you the example. So he saw the blind and he brought sight, spiritual sight and physical sight, okay? The blind, sight. What else did he see? And I'd like your response as your contribution. So we just get a full picture here of these things. Lame, walking. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, demons sent into the pigs from the man. And I might even add to that going, we've got a tormented person and peace. Because I believe that he would still do that sort of miracle, but actually that looks like, could look like in many ways. Yeah, awesome. The woman that was bleeding, yeah. She was, I might even call her downtrodden, right? Because of her condition that she was in so many ways unafforded so much opportunity and physically kept back, and she was released from, from that. Yeah, awesome. I'll go first one and I'll come. Dead to life. There's no metaphor there, but there is also, but awesome. Oh, the same thing. <laughs> Hungry fed. Mm. The leper cleansed. Yeah, wonderful. Hopefully in this, right, you're getting a sense that there's, there's, a, there's a huge array. 
in the scripture that we see with Jesus says there's a lot of physical need, but we actually know from Jesus' ministry of serving others, it was so much more than just a physical need. Spiritual, emotional, psychological, community-based need. Those who were outcast were able to be brought back into community, all sorts of things. But I want to encourage you that up on the screen, we've got a whole bunch of other ones of what it might look like today. And I would say each one of these is an epidemic in the world that we live today of needs that need to be met. And just have a look. I wonder if you look at one of those that might stand out and come to the fore for you that you might recognise maybe not just a need but a person that that need is in. You may be able to recognise maybe even one that you go, that was me. And he met it. You may see one that you go, I've been trying to meet that need, but I'm not quite there yet. And I want to encourage you, if that stands out to you, God, not standing out to you, that's God bringing it to the fore for you. And make sure you speak to someone before you leave this morning about that. But these are some of the needs, not all of them, but some of the needs that we see in our community. And so I want to point out so far this morning in all of this talking about serving others, not once have I said the word rosters. You might sometimes think about serving others like, oh, right, okay, how can I be serving? Oh, well, well, let's hop on a roster. Jesus wasn't talking about rosters. A um, a good friend of mine, uh, much older than I, a family friend from a long time um, at my church in Bendigo as I was the youth pastor, uh, Rodney. There's no no fake name. That's his name, okay? Um, Rodney. I had, to, I had to fill the gap a little bit for our office person as she was going to have some time off. And so I, um, I had to inevitably oversee filling one of the gaps on the roster. Um, someone had to pull out. They um, were so kind and didn't organise someone else to, to take their place. And so then it landed to our office lady who was there for me. And so I called a few people with no success. And I'm thinking, yeah, I've heard her say so many times, the hardest job that she has is trying to fill a roster. And I'm thinking, yes, I know what this is like. And so I eventually call Rodney. I just go, oh, stuff it. I'm just going to go to someone who I know is not going to say no. (laughs) But the ministry that he gave to me in that moment, I call him up. Hey, listen, listen, I know that you're on already three times out of the four this month. Could you do yada yada? You know, I'm giving the pitch. Win him over. And I finished the picture. He goes, yeah, that's no worries. No worries, Johnny. I'm going to be there anyway. I may as well be doing something. I co- Honestly, I couldn't tell you what all the other reasons I had received on the phone that day were. I couldn't tell you. I have no care for them, <laughs> those, those reasons. And the amazing thing, though, was I wasn't encountering someone who cared about what he did but he was prepared to do because of who he was. And so even though we're talking about serving others and my temptation, my, my resisting was not to jump into all the things you could be doing because what you do, as we know in the scriptures, is a reflection of your heart. Your hands and what you're prepared to put your hands to is a reflection of who you are. The ease of having Rodney go, well, I'm going to be there anyway. It's not a burden. It's not a bother because it's not because he was prepared to just do it because of who he was. The awesome thing is, as I encountered that response, I actually felt like I found myself closer to God himself. Because I found someone who was genuinely just pleased and willing and oriented to serve others. I found myself closer to God. So we actually see in these two things that they are interconnected. It's a real shame. I think I skipped over a really, my favourite scripture in the whole wide world. Where is it? No, I didn't. It's coming. Awesome. How does this work right, though? Um, 
Let's start back at the love of God, right? We've got the love of God. And as you push into God more and more, there's a metamorphosis that takes place, a transformation where we find ourselves more and more like God. But we see Jesus' words like this that we might understand and we know from his ministry as we find ourselves more and more like God, we find ourselves more and more willing to serve others, sent out into this world to do the ministry and the work that he did. Because if we're finding ourselves more like Jesus, then we'll find ourselves living more like Jesus. John says to his disciples that the point of this whole entire world, of this living stuff, is that he, Jesus, must become greater and greater and I must become less and less. And so that the more that you are like Jesus, the more that you'll be like Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He met the needs of those around him. There's a few things in this world that absolutely get me buzzing. I'm not talking about any substance, okay? Evangelism. I'm glad you enjoyed that. Um, Evangelism, right? Freaks me out. But I think fortunately as time has gone on, as I've tried to get closer to Jesus, I've found it really hard not to feel like I also need to evangelise. Gives me a buzz like anything. And it's not just the adrenaline because I'm freaking out, okay? Like leading into it, freaking out whilst doing it, and, if, and then kind of freaking out afterwards like, what's going to happen, okay? Um, I get this buzz because when I have tried, this is great, right, because we're about to do an evangelism series at church which we've like a whole program we've worked on ourselves. And it's like, oh, oh, like it gives me this buzz. And I'm also freaking out because is anyone else going to really engage? But what I find whenever I put myself in that position, there's a few key things that happen to me. Afterwards, I pray more. And maybe it's because I was kind of living by faith and putting myself in a position where God had to act and move because I, I feel pretty inadequate. But I feel absolutely driven into prayer. Believe it or not, I actually find the rhythm of reading scripture that week so much more consistent and reliable. And I actually jump into God's word with purpose, expecting to find something because I found myself living like him. And as I find myself living like him, I just, as as we went from one side to the other, as we get to know him, we live like him. As we live like him, we just want to push further into him. And so we have this constant love God, love others, love God, love others. We can't do one. They both have to occur. So I want you to imagine for a moment If some of the scripture Jesus says about himself is true, and if we are actually called to live like him, what do these scripture that Jesus says look like if we use the word we in this instead? We have come so that you might have life and life abundantly. We have come not to do my own will, but the Father's will. We have come to bear witness to the truth. We have come to seek and save the lost. We have come to bring sight to the blind. What do you notice here in these questions, in these these ideas? It's that as we become like him, we are seeking to meet the, the needs of this world, not our own. Jesus is meeting our needs. We seek to meet others. Can you see perhaps the encouragement for us to see a need and fill a need? It's a simple lead to, to not be so caught up in the doing, but in actually who we are called to be. But now is the time for a gut check. Quick gut check. If I, for instance, said, hey, listen, just in a moment, we're going to have a corporate time of prayer. I'm going to get the microphone.
We're going to pray for others. What happens in your gut? I suspect some people go, oh, gosh, I couldn't do that in front of, not, not in, a, in the group, not in a, not in a crowd. Who is that motivating? Who are you motivated by? Are you made, motivated for the sake of others, those people you might pray for? But it's not just those, but as we communally pray, that others in the room are going to get a benefit from what they hear you pray and how you pray, and that they can affirm your prayer? Or are we motivated for ourselves going, oh, no, I couldn't do that? When is Jesus leading us to be self-seeking, self-protecting, or maybe self-sacrificing? So the encouragement for us is to see a need and fill the need, to be motivated for the others. Can you be a need filler? But don't think about it as something else you need to do. I want to encourage you to think about it as a way to identify. Instead of giving food to the hungry, can you perhaps see yourself as a provider? The reason I want you to think about it in this way is because if you, you might have, you know, New Year's resolutions or, or seen something you're like, oh, I want to be better at that or do that. And we, we find so often our habits don't change and nothing changes. But when we actually see a new identity that God has given for us and we try and do something out of our identity in Christ, we are far more likely to do it. So can you see yourself not as someone who tries to feed hungry? Because there's always going to be hungry. You're never going to be able to give enough. But can you see yourself as a provider instead? Instead of being the person all your friends whinge to and honestly you're tired of it, can you see yourself as a listener or an encourager instead? Because I think if you see it from how Jesus wants you to live and a part of your identity, it won't tire you, but you'll actually find life in it. Instead of greeting people at a door, could you see yourself as the one with open arms? So I want you to consider for a moment part of your identity as someone who is loved by God, who knows you, and you're coming to know him. And in that process, you're coming to know who he's made you to be, to then consider what is my identity in serving others? Who am I? Don't jump to the the doing, because that's going to get you tired. But figure out who am I so that he may lead me to the places I should be. Maybe it's not provider. Maybe it's not encourager. Maybe you are teacher, and not just in a classroom, but down in your sporting club, in your friendship group. Sometimes people in a supermarket need teaching as well. Maybe you are the reorienter who can, who can quietly whisper in someone's ear when they're having a bad day, they all of a sudden see a reason to Look at it in a different way. Because as we live out this identity that God has imprinted in each one of us individually, we might find ourselves living more and more like him. You'll be driven straight back into that space of loving him even more and more each day. The less it's about what you do and more about who you are, then I promise you, you will find yourself inextricably loving God more. So I'm going to pray. And that's just the part I want to do. I want to encourage you, if you have a phone, if you have paper, if you have pen, any way to record something down as I pray, as the team come, as we're about to finish in a song, I want you to take the time while I pray to write down, I am And finish that sentence if you can. You are who? 
Because if you can realize who God has made you to be, then you'll find the spaces of serving others that bring life. If you're focused on the doing, it will bring you down and tired and bring ultimately death. But if you can figure out who you are, then he will lead you to serve others in that way and bring life. If you can't finish that sentence, I want to encourage you to find someone who knows you well this morning and ask them, who am I? Because he's given us a community to be a part of and that others might serve us as well. Let me pray. Father God, simply, I love you. And I pray that we love you. I pray that you would lead us to love you better. But God, not for our sake, not for your sake, but God, we understand that this is actually how we see this world healed, that this would be of benefit. Lord, all the things that we see in this world that we mourn about, that we hurt with, Lord, the struggles that we carry with others, that actually if we would find ourselves loving you well, we would find this world better for it. So by your grace, Holy Spirit inside each one of us, May you speak this morning. Reaffirm to those who need reaffirming. Encourage those who need to seek to find. Bring clarity. Bring a word. Lead us with purpose, Lord. Father, we know that as you do these things, So many blessings, Lord. All these will be added unto us. But God, we thank you. It's not just for us. All of these we might see added unto this world. Amen.